Well, you have sorry. a question? Sorry, sorry. Actually, actually, I I I had a cost uh, question in uh, in Ruben's talk. I mean, I don't have a question now. Sorry. Okay, Ethan. Actually, this discussion session is for any type of question for the part three talks. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Then I then I do have a question. Uh, for the past three talks for, for, for Ruben especially. So, so, so I wonder what is the uh, biggest advantage uh, of using this new uh, setup compared with the code atom system? Um, so is there any new merriment technique that they can do in this uh, new setup compared with the code atom system? Hi, um, well, I mean, I would have got it as an example of a code atom system, right? Um, sure. I mean, there are, there's some older mm -hmm. uh, systems, so so they are so they are models which actually cannot be realized there, uh, which is more easy to realize here. Or? Yeah, right, right. So I guess there's different different possible call that platforms. Um, okay, so one one different. Okay, one point is um, that type of interactions is that you could maybe think of of optical lattices where atoms are hopping between different sites, and then you would have an on-site interaction usually in these systems. And here the interaction is quite different, right? So the atoms are actually fixed, held fixed by tweezers. Um, and so each atom, it is, the atom moving around is not the degree of freedom. The atom itself is fixed and it has different, it's either in a ground state or in some particularly excited state. And then the interaction is actually between different atoms rather than having, having an atom hopping around and having an on-site repulsion. That's, for example, one, one difference. Um, and here, that's kind of a key thing we use, this kind of repulsive, well, or how to say this, um, this blockade interaction was, was key to to our proposal. Uh, does that give a partial answer? So, so, so should I say that? Um, so, so maybe the uh, uh, longer range interaction uh, would be the uh, would be the uh, uh, main advantage compared with other atoms. Yeah, that's actually a clear, yeah, it's a clear advantage here. That, for example, if you remember the picture. Um, so to get this dimer uh, constraint, we actually had quite a large interaction distance where a single atom was interacting with, was strongly interacting with six other atoms to actually guarantee this constraint. Um, so that was, yeah, that's a key advantage. Oh, I see, it, okay. Yeah, one, maybe one quick comment is that it's also a, a tricky thing because um, in my talk, I focused on the simplified idea that it's very strong in this disk, like in this blockade disk and negligible outside of this disk. Um, it's kind of a kind of a box function interaction, and in reality, it's actually one of R to the six. So actually, it's interacting with everything, and of course, that makes both numerics a bit harder, and, and also it can in matter for experiment. But that's that's maybe less ideal. But the the, the fact you can have strong interactions over a large distances is a very useful property. Well, so 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 the fact that uh, experimentally you said they observe their uh, loop order parameters, so so does that mean that uh, the uh, temperature scale experimentally can can achieve is actually uh, well. Uh, comparable or even lower than the energy scale of the system, is that right? Yeah, it's a good question. It's, it's a bit tricky to answer because um, also maybe a bit different than the cold atom systems you might be thinking about. It's not that we don't just cool it down um, because indeed the atoms are not moving around. So there's, there's not an obvious way of cooling it down. Rather, the way it starts is you start in some kind of um, product state where all atoms are in the ground state. And then one tries to prepare the state using adiabatic state preparation or quasi-adiabatic state preparation. So this also means you don't actually create a, a, an equilibrium state. So already the notion of temperature is a bit tricky. Um, uh -huh. and, and yeah, there's actually a lot more to say about that. That I, uh, there, there's some subtleties there actually that are can yeah, be. But then, well, but then you need the product state to relax or evolve into the topological state. Is that right? Well, I wouldn't use relax. I would rather say you have to make you have to make sure that you do it slow enough, right? So you don't end up uh, yeah. exciting a lot of stuff. And uh, yeah, so that indeed gives you some time scale, right? Which then um, should be slow with respect to the energy gap. And um, I agree that the fact, to the extent that we see these results, it means we're going, you know, slow to some scale. But there's some extra caveats having to do with uh, there's, there's actually um, a first order transition also in the phase diagram, and it turns out that this state preparation seems to miss this, which is kind of good for us because this first order transition has to do with leaving the topological ordered phase. But this is, I just want to mention this because actually it is indeed a quite, you, you know, it's correct to, to ask this question that it's quite a, a subtle uh, affair that I, I can just give a, a one sentence answer to. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Ethan Lake. Uh, yeah, I had a, just a question for Frank uh, last talk. Yeah, I was just curious, uh, 
you were mentioning at the end how you were saying like the exponents appearing at the uh, phase transition were fractal in some way, right? But uh, I don't know if I, th I think of like, uh, sorry? I, I just agreed with what you, you said, yes. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> And then, but okay, if I think of like normal, regular critical phenomena in StatMac or whatever, right? I like you. You can think of the like anomalous dimensions of operators as fractal dimensions, right? They're both appearing in the the exponents appearing in the similarity law under scale transformations, right? Uh, and and like like you know, anomalous dimensions will tell me like the fractal dimensions of uh, configurations and uh, that are realized at the transition, right? So, in what sense is this critical point like? more fractal than uh, normal. Well, the, the key thing that is uh, different here is that there are lots of low energy excitation. So so basically you have like RG wouldn't really work. You can't really integrate out the high frequency part because there's still lots of low energy excitation at high frequency because of this fractal symmetry. Sorry, but so, sorry. by frequency, do you mean wave wavelength or um, wavelength? Sorry, yeah, by, by um, momentum, yes. Mm -hmm. So you're saying it's it's more about like the scaling, it's more like more about like the approach to the critical point rather than the how the operators at the critical point scale. Right. So you have this kind of uh, yeah, this kind of UV mixing um, at the critical point. Well, but I mean, like normal critical points, there is no there. You have scale invariance, so it's you could kind of say that's UV IR mixing. There is no UV and IR when you have no scale. Well, but UV still mixes into the IR. I mean, this is maybe a way to to put it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, actually, I have a small comment to what he measure. Uh, what he show is actually the energy density correlation. So usually for energy density correlation, there's, it is not affected by the anomalous dimension. And the reason here why it's abnormal is it's only related with the fractal symmetry dimension instead of the true space-time dimension. Because usually if you don't have UVI or mixing or everything is controlled by short long wavelength physics, then how many low energy mode is determined by the space-time dimension and symmetry. Here, once you have subsystem symmetry, in principle, some rough configuration, rough field configuration at high momentum can survive with low energy at a quantum critical point. And that is why the number of independent low energy modes at a quantum critical point is determined by the subsystem symmetry dimension instead of the real mm -hmm. space-time dimension. Yeah, okay, great, thanks. That's helpful. Dominic. Uh, yeah, so I had a question for uh, Xiao Gan. Um, so uh, in order to turn these ideas which you discussed into a classification scheme, as opposed to just a way to construct models, you would need a notion of equivalence relation on networks, right? Like you can, so, so you can determine whether two networks are really the same things yes. or not. I was yes. wondering if you thought about how to, how to do that. Yeah, that's something uh, that's really a very good question. And uh, 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 for example, you can consider uh, you create a, a bubble of uh, the, uh, a sphere of uh, a two dimensional topology order and then merge that to the, uh, to the existing layer. So that would be the one of the equivalence relation. And uh, so the point is that uh, the, uh, uh, this approach, uh, this reverse renormalization, uh, uh, advantage is that give you a discrete set of label. But however, the disadvantage is that those labels are many to one label. So many labels are equivalent. So, so it is a, a, a very interesting uh, try to study the equivalence between those labels. But that's basically, it's like what I just described. You can create a bubble for topology order and, uh, and, uh, and merge this bubble of topology order to the existing layers and, uh, some, and uh, some other thing like that. You know, this kind of thing people have been talking about when you consider crystalline uh, SPD phase. And uh, uh, then for the classifying problem, there's a one, one issue, you know, there's a, uh, 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 Meng Chen uh, have an example yesterday is that uh, you have a layer of uh, coupled uh, quantum Hall states and uh, those seems beyond uh, this, uh, uh, this network uh, picture. 
And uh, so, so I, actually, this is a, a is one of the thing which is even uh, less clear is that uh, what kind of a three dimensional non liquid phase uh, the mid is a network uh, construction and which which kind they don't and uh, it's not very clear to me and uh, you know uh, I'm hoping you know there are certain three D uh, uh, topological order whose boundary maybe like a boundary can always gap, then they have a network kind of, uh, uh, classification. If, a, if boundary can never be gapped, then maybe it's different. So I don't know, so there's maybe something along that direction, uh, try to see whether there's a different kind of a, a 3D non-liquid phase. But sorry, for the equivalence relation in, in the crystalline SPTs, you can kind of prove that the bubble equivalence is for completely exhausts the, the possible equivalence of phases. But here it's more like just a conjecture or yeah, there, there's a certainly. I think the bubble really is equivalence, and but whether they whether they exhaust or not, I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the, this you know this kind of approach is basically like a constructive, and to show whether they exhaust anything. Uh, I'm still thinking about this reverse normalization. Basically, you kind of create a bubble and to make a network from any space. But however, the the the, the caveat is that. Uh, We'll, we'll, we're creating two layers. Although the two layers are far away, but maybe they have a long range topological interaction. That is a concern. Uh, how do you show that you can always uh, decouple the two layer to, for that they don't have a long range topological interaction. And uh, so in particular, I think the mentions this uh, couple the quantum power states is a good example to see, uh, to try to show whether that one have abstraction to have a layered structure and uh, the decouple the layer structure. Uh, I don't know, yeah, this is a really good question. Okay. Yeah, so, Gang, so uh, in terms yeah. of this bubble equivalence, um, it's not an adiabatic deformation, right? You cannot really use uh, a circuit, like a you know, constant depth circuit to create a, a topological order state. Uh, yeah. No, the answer is, uh, I think, yes, because uh, those at the beginning have a very small bubble. I think you can, you can do that. And then you merge this bubble with uh, existing layers. Uh, now I have not stopped on this very, very carefully, but uh, but uh, yeah, I if I'm waving my hand, I say yes, that is a, a constant depth uh, circuit. Man, it's a question of uh, how you know. Are, are you do you allow the depth to be like comparable to the size of the of the uh, you know the network lattice, or do you require the depth to be much smaller than the size of the network lattice? Because in the crystal and SPT case, you can actually make it be much smaller than the network lattice. But I think in the topologically ordered case, you, you wouldn't be able to, to do it. But maybe if you expand the depth so that it's on the order of a network lattice constant. But yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, the depth of circuit should be uh, uh, comparable to the uh, network lattice constant, yes. So I, I was I was gonna ask whether this is something like uh, you know, like in this context of foliated fractal order is like the foliated equivalence where we just define equivalence to to be like you no know, um, to allow insertion of layers of two D topological order. No, right now I mean I'm being very careful. Say I did I didn't use too much of a fractal order because uh, this non liquid phase is even layered quantum Hall states. It's a it's a non liquid phase. So right. uh, so 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 I, I I don't introduce this more uh, uh, more general equivalence. But uh, actually, I think this uh, couple the quantum Hall layer is a very good example. And if you want to blow up a a a a a vacancy which is product states. You may you may have a, a edge states. The edge state may be uh, maybe gapless. So so to try to understand uh, why that state is uh, have abstraction or not have abstraction to <clears> become <throat> a network would be I think would be very instructive. I see. I see. I mean, indeed, all the examples, gap examples we have constructed so far have like maximally chiral surface states. Yeah. Yeah. This may be maybe a relevant factor. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Mataki, you have a question. Yes, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I have several questions, but uh, let me ask a question to Ruben. 
Um, so you showed a nice uh, phase diagram you obtained from the numerics. And uh, maybe I missed your explanation, but it looked to me like uh, the transition between the trivial phase and this Z2 um, topological phase looks like a critical a second order, but uh, the transition to the uh, the VBS phase looked like, like uh, fast order. Is that correct? Or... Yeah, that's exactly correct. Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, are these uh, transitions? Uh, okay. So if I understand correctly, this Z2 topological phase itself is essentially um, similar to the toric code ground state. But uh, do, do you see any difference concerning the universal class or something about the, the, the transition to the other non-topological phase? Um, well, so yeah, it's, it's the same as a Tory code, but the one caveat that it's an odd Z2 gauge theory. So uh -huh. it's, a, it's as if you take a Tory code, but you change the sign of the vertex term, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess as long as you enforce translation symmetry, those are actually two distinct phases. Um, but uh, other than that, it's completely the same. Um, and the, 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 the reason for the, right, so the, the transition towards a trivial Higgs phase, so to, see, so to speak, is should it just be the, you know, two plus one D gauged Ising as expected. Uh, we haven't been able to, you know, confirm that with our system sizes, but it's, it, it's very, like, it, the signatures seem to be there. And one last comment is, the, the reason it's first order is because the VBS actually has, has a quite humongous uh, unit cell, right? So you would, Mm -hmm. I from, think from simple symmetry right. reasons, you could argue it, you shouldn't expect a stable continuous transition. And um, so, so the string order parameter you measured numerically, but uh, experimentally, it's not uh, realistic to measure string order parameter, right? Oh, no. So this, uh, um, this was actually experimental plots well, at the, towards the oh, end. Oh, so I see. So okay, for example, then I, I, okay, so I misunderstood. Okay, sorry. Yes. Yeah, no, no, sorry. I, I, I did go through this very quickly, so my bad. Um, but just to mention, oh, so all, experimental. Oh. all the plots on these two slides are, are experimental I see. Well, measurements. Okay. Well, yeah. okay. Yeah, you said the experimental data. <laughs> sorry, I was missing the title. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Thanks for checking. I see. Yeah, thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay, IAS Group Media Technologies. Yeah, I have a question about the last talk and its follow up on an earlier question. Uh, so there's this putative second order point. Is it scale invariant or not? Because if it is scale invariant, then there should be this power law behavior that was exhibited. But you also said that it has UVIR mixing. So it's mm -hmm. not how you can have both of them at the same time. Okay, uh, I mean, in fact, for this question, I mean, maybe Itri can say something about it because she is certainly an expert on, on this derivation. Itri, do you want to comment on this? Actually, Nati, for your scale invariant, are you referring to the correlation function at a quantum critical point? Uh, actually, for the correlation, because what we show for the power law is the energy density correlation. For the correlation function at quantum critical point, it does not exhibit a power law correlation. It is more short range the correlated, but nevertheless, its decay is still much more slower than the usual exponential. And uh, for scale invariant, actually, here we only have discrete scale invariant. I don't know what it means. I, I thought that they're either power laws or exponentials, or this is something which is completely different. Yeah, so, it is something which is completely different. Like even for your Plaquet, uh, you are version of the Plaquet ether model in the liquid phase. If you calculate the four point correlator uh, on the lattice, not in the continuum, what you will find is it is short ranged correlated and the K as exponential minus ln x times ln y which is faster, decays faster than any power law, but it decays slower than any exponential. Right, but if you go to very long distances, what's, and whatever decays too fast, you set to zero. What's the answer? What do you mean? So you look at the collection of all correlation functions on the lattice, and you go to very long distances. Mm -hmm. So you, you consider the same correlation functions and distances getting longer and longer, and mm -hmm. whatever, it's too fast to set it to zero. 
will the remaining answers be scale invariant or not? Mm. What I just said is the textbook. This is what the textbook tells you to do, right? It's not something. It's not fully scale invariant, but if you fix y, uh, one scale and only um, do the renormalization or cost green for the other one, that has scale invariant. But if you rescale both X and Y simultaneously. Uh, it's not scale invariant, definitely not scale invariant. And actually it is pretty essential to not having such kind of scale invariant, otherwise you won't have subsystem symmetry and you won't have UVIR mixing. So I guess if these rough parts remain, right? So these kind of high degeneracy we get from the subject symmetry. So in what sense is this a critical point? What is critical about it? Well, we do find at least, I mean, I, I can talk more about the numerics, but from the numerics, we see that we do find this algebraic behavior, this is algebraic decay of the energy correlators. While the three point correlator or like the many body correlators, they have a decay that's from the numerics seems neither exponentially and uh, neither exponential nor power law. So if you look at uh, unequal time correlators, it seems like everything that the UV are mixing is in space. So if you look at the temporal correlators and maybe they're perfectly critical still or. Right, we just did some numerics on that. So we just tried Monte Carlo to get the um, spectral functions. And there we do see kind of gap closings at the at the critical point. Yeah, and also mention that and Senko, you are still raising your hand. I'm sure you still have questions. Oh, yeah, I, just, I, I have a very quick and basic question. So, so is there a definition for UVIR mixing? So, so what exactly does UVIR mixing mean? Okay, probably Nati is the right person to answer this question. But here, the reason we why we call it a UVIR mix, mixing is uh, the quantum critical point is not just affected by long wavelength physics and actually the short wavelength physics plays an important role because short wavelength mode can survive at low energy at a quantum critical point. The second is if you look at a quantum critical point, the low energy state correspond to some rough field configurations in space. Okay, probably Nati have a more concrete answer. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually discuss that on Friday. Hmm. Okay. Well, uh, so so, but so well, but in your in your in your model, actually, uh, you 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 measure the uh, density density correlation. It has a nice uh, uh, scaling dimension, but that scaling dimension is the uh, fractal dimension. Uh, it does mm -hmm. not look like this a uh, UV physics in that expression. Am I right? It's it's not like some of the other model. We know some scaling dimension has no UV input. Or do you mean it's not like some Clarke easy model or something like that, such that the correlation functions power law decay do depend on your UV cutoff? Oh, this, well, so for example, this uh, Clarke model, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm not sure how to call it. It's, so, so this model scaling dimension, well, for, for the subsystem symmetry, the scaling dimension does depend on the UV cutoff. But in your mm -hmm. model, it looks like uh, it, it's more, it's more, uh, more, you know, conventional CFT like. Uh, yeah, but okay. The, the issue is actually even even for your Clarke easy model, if you just uh, calculate the density density energy density correlation function, it's one over r x square r y square. It doesn't depend. The power law does not depend on the on the on the UV scale. What depends on the UV scale is is if you calculate the four point correlation function on a thinner stripe, then what you will find is if you change the dipole length scale, then the power law decay would change. Oh, sure, sure, but sure, here. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, go 
Yeah, but here all we can access, at least at a numerical or at a Gaussian level theory side is the energy density correlation. We're not sure if we calculated the many body correlator at, for different geometry, whether there is a way to find such kind of UEIR mixing such that if we change one of the scale, then the power law decay correlation function can be dependable on that. It might exist, but we never find one. Let me just clarify one point here. You cannot discuss the notion of scaling dimensions if you do not have a scale symmetry. The logical mm -hmm. is first you should check whether the system has scale symmetry. And if it does, up you can assign scaling dimension to operators. It makes no sense to assign scaling dimensions to operators without having scaling symmetry. So that's why I asked whether the system is or is not scaling variant. And if I understand correctly, the answer is that it's not. If it's not scaling variant, if there is any scale transformation, then you can assign eigenvalues for the scale transformation, but not otherwise. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, for some simpler cases like Katsenka's plaque easing model, or even for the Fermi surface case, they, although there's UVIR mixing, what they can do is consider something what they call the reduced uh, scale invariance, such that we keep the one length scale, say, in the x direction, and only cost screen the length scale in the transverse direction. And there, what you will find is in the perpendicular direction, you still have scale invariance. And uh, this is what they mean by scaling dimension for that operator in the plaque easy model or the U1 version of the plaque easy model. I feel like what it's saying is that there is some kind of scale invariance in your theory. It's just a, like, for example, in Fermi liquid theory, which we understand well, I mean, there is a scale invariance in Fermi liquid theory. It's just a kind of exotic one because you have scale invariance, but you also have a, a wave vector, KF, which doesn't scale under this putative scale invariance. So it's a kind of an exotic scale invariance, but it's still, a, in some sense, a scale invariance. Um, I don't know if that uh, makes any sense. Yes, and Annette and Manchin, do you still have questions if you still raise the hand? Yes, uh, I had a question for Frank uh, about uh, one of the plots about the Binder ratio. Mm -hmm. um, so it, I was looking at the plot and it seems like they they only cross at sort of like l greater than 20 so i was wondering if uh that that's sort of an effect of the uvir mixing or how, how should i think about it? are you asking well that's not obvious to me i mean right if, if the clusters are too small i mean then the kind of symmetries act in a very trivial way i mean but i i, I don't have an explanation for why this crossing only appears at sufficiently large system sizes I, mean, I think that there's maybe some intrinsic length scale on, on short, on really short length scales. Yeah. And another quick question. I was wondering how you pick these system sizes, like 8, 10, 13, 16. What, what, what are the rules for these? Um, this was, this is somewhat arbitrary. <laughs> so there's no, no deep reason in this. I mean, like okay. there are certain system sizes which are, are special. I mean, like, uh, in terms of the degeneracies, right? So there's a unique ground state if we have system sizes of uh, two to the n, and we have maximum degeneracy if, if it's two to the power of n minus one. But I mean, one thing we just wanted to use different geometries to to make to check which which of the results depend on the details on the geometry, and and the, so we we picked the system sizes to have different cases. But other than that, there's no specific reason. Thank you. Can I ask a question uh, to Frank? Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you can you give some uh, feeling? Can you describe the ordered state? How do I then? What is a good way to understand the ordered state? Well, the orders that we do have, like I I showed early on this picture where we have now this uh, sublattice symmetry, right? So that we have this sublattice structure where we have. Like this is this this um, uh, Sipinski gasket, and the way that we can imagine this state is that we do have kind of perfect correlations, or like that we have um, spin correlations within this structure. No, but so, so for the small, I mean, there's 
you know, this extensive degeneracy, the sub-extensive degeneracy mm-hmm. yeah, at zero transverse field. But once you put on a transverse field, what is the, uh, you know, can I think of it as like, you know, like in a Tory code where you have like a superposition of loops or, or. No, the way that I think about it is much simpler. I mean, I, I think that we do have these, symmetry broken pattern, but then we have fluctuations around those symmetry broken patterns. So the symmetry broken pattern is this gasket. Uh, right. It's a gasket, I see. Yeah, and this is what, I mean, like the other way to think about is like the, this many body correlator that I, that I showed, right? So that's exactly the one that measures the correlations between the spins in this gasket. But, but I guess I'm confused. If you have, if your transverse field term is zero, then isn't the ground state just all plaquettes, all spins, you know, up, let's say, or all spins down? No, no this is one of the ground states, right? So like if yeah, that depends on the, like, let's say that you just take a, a torus which has a system size of two to the power of n minus one, then you have one ground state is the one where actually all spins are pointing up, but another ground state would be the one, uh, let me just, show this yeah, if you can show that i just forgotten your picture so. right so so here these are two ground states right so the left hand is the ground is it is it is the obvious ground state right so that all spins are pointing up right but if i just flip all the spins on this gasket now we have a subset of spins are pointing the other direction like they're pointing down yeah, it's still a ground state it's still a ground state right well so that's what i'm asking so then now the the, at h equals zero, at gamma equals zero, these are just completely degenerate. That's the sublattice symmetry. Mm-hmm. But now in the on, at finite gamma, should I think of them as equal superposition? You know, ground state is equal superposition of all these. Uh, right, there would be a superposition of those ground states. Yes, so there would be a. So that's why the order is shorter. You know. In terms of spins, the order is short ranged. Exactly right. So, so if you just look at the two point correlation function, they would decay in right. to in, in both phases, and that's why we just had to had to use this many body correlator to right. distinguish those phases, right? So, so because that this one exactly is probing basically on these caskets. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Actually, we are running behind the schedule, and let's thank all of the speakers.